Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two in my Commodore 64 Repair-a-thon video series. If you haven't yet seen part one, I recommend you watch that first. I'll put a link to it up in the corner here and also in the video description below. In part one, we took a look at the tools I'm going to be using to help me diagnose these machines. And then we took a deep dive look at the first of four Commodore 64s I'm going to be working on. Unfortunately, after some quick troubleshooting, that machine had more problems with it than I was ready to work on at that point, so I set it aside, and we'll fix that machine in an upcoming part. At the end of part one, we were just starting to look at the second machine, so let's get back to that right now. Okay, machine number two. <laughs> it's missing a key. Uh, you know what? It's actually quite a lot cleaner. The case, top case looks good. The bottom of the machine not so nice. I see it's got two screws in, missing the middle one. And otherwise, oh, I guess we got some broken clips because that side's not holding on. All right, let's crack this open. Okay, so both of those are the spin when you turn the screwdriver, which would imply that the standoffs are broken on the top. That standoff is still intact. I don't know why the screw is just spinning. The screw just fell out there. Here's a broken clip. That clip is fine, so we just have one busted clip. And this standoff here on this side is broken. And so is the middle one. That's why there was no screw there. It's funny, the top of the case looks pretty good otherwise. Oh, I almost forgot to label the case. So we're gonna call this machine number two. All right, hey, it's got all the chips. Ooh, it has some sockets. That means this thing has been reworked as well. At least it has screws holding in the motherboard. Ah. Oh. Look at this. There's a screw. It's just sort of lying right there on the motherboard. It's pretty much a good reason why when you get these computers, it's good to open them up right away because you just don't know what's happened to them. And that, that screw could have easily shorted something out. So it looks like this is a the same revision board as my Ziff socket machine, which is good because if there's anything wrong with it, I can compare with the Logic Probe between that machine and uh, that works and this one. And from a socketed perspective, nothing is socketed except for the kernel ROM. And I'm sure that the VIC-2 is in a socket. And then of course there's two logic chips here. Okay, there's broken standoffs on the bottom because those are just spinning. It should just come out even though we still got some screws. Yeah, this, goodbye. Yep, we got broken standoffs. All right, someone went through the effort of putting some sockets in and then they re-soldered this uh, shield back on. You can see uh, these are the two sockets, they're white. Those are definitely not OEM. At least this machine doesn't have any of the MOS logic. There's another chip in a socket right here too, this uh, 7406. The RAM is Fujitsu. We got this ROM here that looks in a socket, but I think that could be original Commodore. The rest of this stuff, well, we'll see when we take the bottom off what's been reworked really on this board. Goodbye. All right, let's get this shield off. These are easier to take off than the other ones. Oh, at least there was a little heat sink compound on the Vic chip there. Okay, what do we see when we flip this over? You know what? If anyone reworked this, they cleaned up after themselves because these two have had sockets installed and I, I really don't see any evidence that anyone has worked on this board. Okay, so there's some cobwebs on here, but that's in a socket and these two plus this chip. Yeah, wow, that, that, just, looks, that just looks perfect. So whoever's worked on this, if it was not done at the factory, if these weren't at the factory, they did a really fantastic job. There is no flux residue on the bottom. Okay, let's power this up. Do some quick voltage checks on this. Nothing's plugged in, just the power supply. Got this here on volts, DC. So we check the 12 volt regulator here. 12.1. Five volt regulator here. 4.94, we check the v, the VCC pin on one of the logic chips, 4.96, and we can check the voltage coming in from my power supply right there, 5.0. So things are looking good, and I'm just gonna do a quick touch test, to see if anything is burning hot. I mean, this thing might work, to be honest. Just everything seems okay, caps are fine. 
All right, let's plug in the monitor and see what happens when I turn it on. No diagnostic cartridge inserted. Brown. Well, let's put in the uh, dead test cart, but I have a feeling that just could be a bad Vic chip. Okay. Okay, so we're getting flashing and it's going between red and white. So that does indicate that potentially there's a bad RAM chip as well. But the colors are wrong. That should be black and it should be a white flash. So let's take this Vic out of here and I will test it in the other one. I'm just going to clean this heat sink compound off with the IPA. I do this because I don't want this junk to get on top of my, uh, get onto my my chip puller tool because the way it, it grabs the chip on the sides is some of the white stuff it's going to get on the gut on it. So in fact, I'm just going to put a little bit more and just get it off this edge here. All right, there we go. So we just take this, make sure the power's off, which it is. Put this down onto the chip like that. Pull up. Chip comes right out. Easy as pie. While we're at it, let's remove the kernel ROM. There we go, kernel ROM out. So dead test doesn't use that, so I don't think that fault we we're seeing there with the, the brown color is due to the kernel ROM. But if we're gonna have the other board out, if we're gonna use my test machine, we might as well test it while we're at it. Okay, let's make sure this works. Okay, there we go, we got picture. So first off, let's test the Vic. Let's take out the known good one. Pop in the one I just yanked out. Here we go. Okay, so clearly the brown <laughs> is not the Vic chip because it is working. Let's put a big check mark on there. And we'll check the kernel ROM while we're at it. Let's yank this one out. Okay. Oh, I was like, no picture. Yeah, I didn't put the Vic back in. There we go. So this is the kernel ROM from there. Oh, and that is a good chip as well. So check mark. All right, so back to this one. How strange that we're getting that weird screen. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the known good Vic back in here. A little deoxid. All the pins are fine. Boom, like that. Kernel ROM. Put some deoxid as well. Okay, turn this back on. Yeah, still getting that flashing and the weird colors. If I pull out diagnostic cartridge and it just goes to the brown screen. Let's pop out these other chips that are socketed. And just check what, what's going on underneath there. These are 74 LS257s, both of these in the white sockets. The two of those same part number, and the one that was in this socket over here is a 7406. I'm just curious with those out, if I turn this on, do we get a difference? And we get a black screen. Okay, let's plug in the dead test again. Yeah, we're just getting a solid black screen. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test these in my Mini Pro. All right, Mini Pro. So first one we're gonna test is the 7406. Just pop that in the tester. It's already selected, I hit test. Okay. That was in backwards. Luckily this thing has overcurrent protection. Okay, test results normal. And the other ones are 74 LS 257s. All right, hit test. Results normal. And the other one. Results normal. Okay, so these chips are all working. Very junky sockets here. They're single wipe sockets, again, so really not good quality. I'll make sure this one is in the right way since I had it backwards in the tester. Okay, there we go. Just for poops and giggles, we will test this again. All right, same brown screen. Okay, so at this point, we got this weird color and then we have the flashing. Now, one flash with the dead test cartridge, when you look up the manual, tells you on this revision of the 64 that it's U12, which is 
this RAM chip right here. Before I yank this RAM chip out, I think I'm gonna put the PLA in a socket. The PLA is this chip right here. This goes bad a lot on Commodore 64s, and this one had no heat sink or anything on it. So I'm gonna pull that out, and we're gonna test that on the other machine, see if that, if that does the trick. Because if the PLA is not working, it causes all sorts of issues with memory and everything else. So it can definitely cause the dead test to, you know, lead you to a false sense that one of these chips is bad. I'll pull this out first, and we'll just rule that out from the outset. All right, if you've seen my other videos before, or you've seen this desoldering iron, it's pretty crappy. So I don't recommend you buy this one, but it's all I got, so I'm going to use this. Before I desolder a chip, I mark the board with a, a Sharpie, and I can put an X here just so I don't accidentally desolder the wrong pins. Because let me tell you, I've done that many times before. All right, here we go. go. Now that chip will be hot, so a <laughs> few little holes need cleaning up, but no lifted traces at all. That's the good thing about my hot air method. Now once the chip is out, it's very easy to suck the extra solder out of the holes. Okay, let's bring out the Ziff machine again. Plug it in to the video and the power. Turn it on. Okay, we're working good. Take out the known good PLA and we're going to put the one I just desoldered. Nice thing is because these ZIF sockets, you know, you're not pushing into a socket, uh, I don't have to worry about cleaning up the, the pins first. And look, it's not working. It's funny, it has a slightly different effect in this one. We're getting that a blue screen versus, versus the orange screen, but... Okay, so I am going to draw an X on this bad ship so that I don't mess these up. I always draw an X with the Sharpie on there. And let's put the good one back in one more time. Just make sure that my machine is fine and not messed up. Oh. Yeah. The dead test cartridge is in. <laughs> and it takes a second before that comes up. So let's actually put that back in again with the X. Uh, this is the chip with the X on it from the other machine. Let's put that in. And let's just let it sit on the dead test screen for a minute. Because it takes what? Like that was 20 seconds before... Oh, look! Brown and blue. Flashing one. Exactly like the other one. Alright, well that clinches it. That's bad. So what I'll do is I'll put a socket in the other one and we'll test this known good PLA. And that board is probably going to work. Let's uh, install this into this board. And solder this baby in. It's being a little stubborn. Sometimes you just have to kind of poke at the holes with a pick or something. There's just a little like, I don't know, like what do you call it? A dag of solder, just a little blah, a little piece of it left that might that might prevent the chip from, go, the uh, socket from going in easily. See, look at that, that's all I had to do. Okay, so my technique for soldering a socket, you solder one pin on each side, and then that way you can heat them up and push it back on the board so you know it's sitting flat. So get your soldering iron up to temperature. Don't solder more than one on each side. Okay, one on each side, and I think the socket kind of Oh yeah, it did, it like half fell out. So that's exactly why you don't do more than one on each side. So what you do is I'm holding it with my finger, make sure you don't hold the metal contacts, and then you heat up the solder joint on one side and then you give the socket a nice push so you know it's sitting flat against the PCB. There we go, I did both and, and it kind of, I felt it move a little bit. Just give it a visual inspection, make sure it's sitting flat, make sure all the pins are looking good, make sure the orientation of the socket is correct, which it is. And now I'm going to do the rest of the pins. Okay, it's all soldered. I'm just going to clean this up with the uh, spray some IPA on here with a little toothbrush just to get that that uh, extra flux off there. One second. So I'm going to switch this from dead test to regular diag modes. And this is the non-dead test, which means this needs the ROMs to be working, the, the basic and the kernel ROMs. Dead test doesn't require those. 
So we'll let this run through a little bit. Um, interesting is you'll see a few things that fail on here, and that's because I don't have the test harness hooked up. I don't even have a test harness. So without that, you're gonna end up with bad on some of these chips and stuff, but you can ignore that. It generally is working. But to test to see if your two CIA chips are working, these two clocks down here that currently say 40 a.m. and 40 p.m., both of the CIA chips have timers and it can keep time, essentially time. And if there's something wrong with the chips, or the chips are missing, for instance, these will have garbage in it. Both of these times down here won't have correct times. But you can see both are counting up correctly, 57 seconds, a.m. and p.m. So that means that the chips are generally working. They may still have faults, but they at least are not totally dead. So I'm going to call this one fixed. So I'm just going to write with my Sharpie right on the RF modulator here, fixed. And that way we know that this one at least is one good board. I keep my dead chips in a little container here called dead parts. This dead PLA goes in here. All these other, lots of Commodores, lots and lots of Commodore chips. All of this stuff is stuff that I have fixed computers and found bad chips on, if you can believe it. Tons and tons of bad chips. So I stick it in here, that way it doesn't get accidentally reintegrated with any of my supplies. Okay, moving on to the third 64. This one is really heavy, which is weird. I don't know why it's so heavy. Maybe it has the metal shielding on it. It's in pretty good shape. It's got all three screws. Clips don't appear to be broken. The only thing that's happened is this uh, vent here is, is busted, but that could actually be epoxied. The rest seems in decent shape. Yes, it has a missing uh, number one key, but other than that, it's not too bad. Ooh, the screws are on very tightly. All right, we're gonna label this number two. Rather, if this is number three. Ah, yes, and the weight, metal shielding. Oh, and this is one of the later revisions. I like this type the most. Of the er, of the bread bins, I prefer this one because it's got the reduced um, number of chips here, so it's using the 8701, or rather, yep, this one's the 8701 right here to kind of replace all that circuitry, but it has really clear video output. When this thing works, it's really clear. This one seems to have all of its screws. That might indicate that no one has ever worked on this machine. So again, this, this shielding stuff, I don't keep these. So yeah, th this has a thermal thermal compound on here because at least this heat sinks the chips to some extent, but I personally leave this off. And then I put heat sinks right onto the chips themselves because I think that does a lot better job. Look at Commodore, look look at this. The, the part that touches the chip is this part right here and they put thermal, thermal compound over there. So the part that's touching the Vic chip doesn't even have any any thermal compound. So this was doing basically nothing for that particular chip. Okay, so let's get all the screws out for the motherboard. That one there, and this one here. All right. Bottom case, decent shape. No broken standoffs, that's cool. And let's just draw a number three on here. Okay, now checking out this machine. I am Loving it so far, check it out. All the chips are socketed, all the primary chips. How awesome is that? That should make fixing this thing really easy unless there's a RAM or a logic chip fault. I'm gonna cut that bottom shield off and let's take a look at the bottom side. That's one RF shield gone. Okay, taking a look at this board. On the bottom, it looks factory fresh, which matches what we're seeing on the top here. Hey there, hey, this video's gotta end here. Otherwise it would be way too long. Part three will be coming very soon. If you liked what you saw so far, I'd appreciate a thumbs up on this video. Definitely subscribe because part three will be coming very soon and other videos as well. If you didn't like this, you know what to do. Give me a thumbs down. I'd appreciate your comments and suggestions in the comment section below. And thanks for watching. Bye.